All right, thank you. My name is Jeszka Bodica. I'll chair this second uh, spotlight session. Uh, the format is just as before. We'll have five short talks back to back, and uh, we'll have time for questions uh, right afterwards. So the first talk in the session is Unsupervised Visual Motor Control Through Distributional Planning Networks by Tian He Yu, Kleb Shevchuk, Dorsa Sadiq, and Chelsea Finn, and Chelsea will be presenting. Hi, my name is Chelsea Finn. I'll be presenting this work on behalf of Tian He Yu, who wasn't able to make it today due to visa reasons. Our work is on unsupervised visiomotor control. So reinforcement learning has enabled robots to perform a wide variety of complex tasks. However, in many situations, we need to engineer the environment in order to provide an objective for reinforcement learning. If we hope to deploy robots into real world environments, we need robots to be able to learn and adapt in the real world, and in order to do so, robots need to be able to internally evaluate objectives from raw observations. In this work, we aim to enable autonomous reinforcement learning without manually specified reward functions and without environment instrumentation. We consider a restricted setting where we want to reach different goals, and we specify a goal with an image of the goal. The key challenge with this problem setting is determining how close two images are from each other. Using pixel distance or distance in the latent space of a variational autoencoder pays attention to the most salient objects in the scene, and not necessarily how hard it is to reach that image, while an inverse model provides a control-centric representation but doesn't necessarily provide a good metric. In this work, we aim to acquire a visual goal representation through autonomous unlabeled interaction. The first insight that we use in this work is the fact that random interaction is optimal under the zero-one reward function of reaching the final state. That is, if a robot takes a random trajectory, in hindsight, this trajectory is optimal if your goal is to reach this state at the last time step. In this work, we show how we can use this insight in order to optimize for a goal representation. In particular, to do that, we consider the question, which representation, when used as a reward function, will cause a planner to choose the actions observed in the data? First, we collect random unlabeled interaction data, as shown here. Then we train a latent space representation and a latent dynamics model such that if we run trajectory optimization with respect to the final state, we recover the observed action sequence. Essentially, we're embedding a trajectory optimization procedure as a differentiable layer within a neural network. Then we discard the latent dynamics model and use the, the goal representation x as a reward function for reinforcement learning. We refer to our approach as distributional planning networks since we're embedding a planning procedure into a neural network and modeling distributions over actions in the data. We evaluate first on three simulated domains and we compare our DPN approach to a pixel distance metric, a metric induced by a variational autoencoder, and a metric induced by an inverse model, as done in prior work. We see that in our simulated comparisons, across the board, our approach is able to produce a metric that leads to successful reinforcement learning for these tasks. In many situations, such as, uh, such as using deformable objects, it's very hard to specify a goal objective. Uh, in this case, we find that pixel distance VAEs and inverse models aren't able to produce a metric that leads to successful reinforcement learning that actually pays attention to uh, the position of the rope, as shown in the top left. While our approach is able to learn a metric that leads to successful reinforcement learning, both reaching the desired object position as well as the desired arm position. In our first real-world experiment, we consider a very simple reaching task where the goal is to reach a goal image just from raw pixel observations. A VAE struggles to learn a metric in this space, while our approach and inverse model approach perform comparably well. While in a more complex setting, such as manipulating objects, the inverse model fails to produce a metric that can meaningfully represent the position of objects, while our approach learns a metric that leads to successful reinforcement learning. The main takeaway of our work is that we enable autonomous reinforcement learning of goal-reaching tasks without any reward engineering by training a visual goal representation from unlabeled interaction. For more details, come see us at the poster. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the second talk in the session is Learning Robotic Manipulation Through Visual Planning and Acting by Angelina Wang, Tanard Kurutach, uh, Aviv Tamar, and Peter Liu. Hi, I'm Angelina, and today I'm gonna to talk about learning robotic manipulation through visual planning and acting from Berkeley and Technion. 
So our motivation is that we want to be able to solve robotic manipulation problems, which for us is something like moving a rope from a start state to a goal state. The inspiration is that humans are able to vividly imagine how we're going to solve a problem like rope manipulation, and we want to be able to transfer the skill over to robots, which would in turn make for an interpretable method. Using this, we want to be able to use this imagination as the basis for control. So for us, um, having a machine imagine means a visual plan. That's why our data takes the form of sequential observations O and O prime and an action A that brings the former to the latter. This data is collected from random perturbations of the system that are hoping to capture the dynamics of what is physically feasible. The problem is that given an observation start and observation goal, we want to be able to generate and execute the visual plan that is going to bring the object all the way to the goal state. Uh, the relevant, one of the relevant models for our work is called the causal infogan. And what's important is that this model can take in as input start state is shown on the left and the goal state is shown on the right in color and generate all of the intermediary steps in the middle, which is shown in black and white, that shows the object moving through and progressing to the goal state. So now that we have the visual plan, we train an inverse model for control, which outputs an action given to observations. So putting all of the steps together, we have a causal infogan model that generates a visual plan and an inverse model that actually acts on and executes this plan. The real world domain we used is that of a rope taped down on one end and two obstacles that moves through. These all add additional physical constraints into what is feasible. Some of the challenges this introduces are the obstacles and needing to plan around them, um, the fact that the obstacles can actually move between trajectories, and that we have to run the control model on an imagined plan despite being trained only on real images rather than generated ones. One of the challenges was the fact that the obstacles move between trajectories. To deal with this, we use a new model called the context conditional causal infogan. For this, we feed in as contextual input the image of the obstacle to the transition generator and discriminator models. This way, the generator is able to condition on the obstacle, which doesn't move during a trajectory, and can focus on generating the rope, which is going to change between the different observations that it generates. This is an example of our result where we compare against the baseline of just running the inverse model onto the goal image rather than each intermediary step generated. On the top in black and white, the visual plan shows the plan generated by our model about what the robot is going to plan to do. Right below it, under acting, is what happens when we actually run the inverse model on the rope and the robot follows through to follow the plan. Below in the baseline, you can see that the rope is unable to reach the goal state because the inverse model by itself is not able to do the forward thinking needed to plan and move the rope around the obstacles. In summary, our data is collected from random rope movements, and using this, our causal infogan generates the visual plan. Then when we run the inverse model, we're able to actually execute as seen in the video, where the robot follows the plan in the column and actually moves the rope into the goal state. In conclusion, we're proposing a safe, interpretable alternative to model-free reinforcement learning, because by allowing us to peek inside of the algorithm's mind, we know what the robot is going to try to do before it actually does it. This also allows for quick model inspection, because we can see what the plan looks like and decide if we actually want to run it on the robot and thus save robot time. Thank you. Thank you. So the third talk in the session is Shafornat, Learning to Drive by, imitation, by Imitating the Best and Synthesizing the Worst uh, by Jan, Mayank Banzal, Alex Krzyzewski, and Abhijit Ogale. So, uh, Mayank is going to uh, present. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Mayank Bansal. Uh, in this work, we explore how far we can take imitation learning alone for the task of autonomous driving. Um, to allow us to uh, both train and evaluate in simulation, first we choose a mid-level input and a mid-level output representation. So as shown here, we have a top-down view with outputs from a perception system. Our net, the chauffeur net, processes it to produce a sequence of waypoints, which we can convert to driving controls using any controls optimization framework. 
In more uh, concrete details, uh, we fix uh, an area of 80 by 80 meters around the agent, as shown by the, uh, the black grid here. And we express all the surrounding context within the same view. So in this case, we have the roadmap, traffic lights, perception objects, also the planned route, which shows the intent. And we produce a sequence of waypoints using a recurrent neural network within the same grid. We train a convolutional recurrent neural network using 26 million expert driving examples. And then we evaluate it in a closed loop environment within a simulator. Interestingly, even with this large amount of data, we find that the model still runs into uh, the dagger issue. So in this example, as uh, the car approaches a tight curve, we find that uh, the errors accumulate, and there's a drift issue where uh, the test examples quickly go out of the training distribution, and the model doesn't know uh, how to recover from this situation. In this work, uh, we propose the idea of synthesizing perturbations. So given a training example like this, uh, where the car is driving down the middle of the road, we can perturb its location as well as heading to generate a new example by fitting a new trajectory completely automatically, which brings it back to the center of the road. Now we can do this for all our examples, and unlike Dart and Dagger, we don't need any expert input, so this becomes a powerful cue since we can actually uh, augment all our training data this way. So this is the result on the video we saw before, where now even in this situation, it's able to issue correcting commands to be able to recover and complete the turn. Now to generalize the net even further to handle avoid collisions, we uh, introduce the idea of auxiliary losses. So in this case, uh, we render the agent box from the output, and we overlay it on top of the known ground truth to measure a specific loss which guides the network. Now since we are using imitation learning here, all our training examples come from experts, and correspondingly, they don't have any collisions. Unlike RL, we can't really introduce them, but because we're using synthesized perturbations, they already have synthetic collisions which help guide this loss throughout training. We also co-train uh, some other tasks, like predicting the future of other agents. So we add a, another head called the perception RNN, which predicts simultaneously the future of all the other agents in the scene, and uh, it helps guide the main network because of shared features. Finally, we introduce the idea of imitation dropout. This lets the network explore alternative futures uh, completely constrained only by the environmental constraints. In this way, it can actually go beyond imitation to really uh, explore. So this is a driving example in simulation. The agent approaches a red traffic light. As it turns green, uh, it's able to continue and make progress naturally. We also deployed it on a full-size Chrysler Pacifica and tested it at our test track. In this case, we can see the smooth driving as it comes to a full stop automatically on the stop sign, and uh, it will continue making a very smooth right turn. Thank you. For more details, please come see us at our post. Thank you. The fourth talk in the session is Improvisation Through Physical Understanding using novel objects as tools with visual foresight by Annie Shee, Frederick Gibbert, Sergey Levin, and Chelsea Finn. And to to present. Hi, I'm Annie, and I'll be presenting Improvisation Through Physical Understanding. This is joint work with Frederick Ebert, Sergey Levin, and Chelsea Finn. Of the recent advances in robot learning, some have enabled robots to master really challenging skills, and others have given them the ability to generalize to new scenarios and goals. However, a lot of these approaches can only do one or the other. For example, learning from demonstrations can learn difficult skills, but in narrow settings, while approaches based on predictive models can learn simple skills in very general settings. So naturally, we ask, how can we achieve both? We study this question in the context of robotic tool use. For example, when presented with this scene on the left, how can a robot realize to use a sweeper, which is never seen before, to move the clutter onto the dustpan? We approach this problem by building upon the visual foresight framework, in which a visual predictive model is learned from unsupervised interactions. 
This approach can solve a number of simple tasks, but if we consider the more complex interactions that occur in tool use settings, unsupervised experience is not enough. So we inject a bit of guidance in the form of diverse multitask demonstrations. Then we fit an action proposal model to this data that looks at a scene and outputs actions that encourage multi-object interaction. Uh, this model is now useful for directing the robot's data collection phase. The robot collects data by taking random actions and sampling the action proposer. And this experience, combined with examples from the bare pushing data set, is used to train a predictive model over images. Then at test time, when given a new task, we can again sample the action proposal model for potential plans as well as sampling completely random ones. To make things a little bit more concrete, let's say we want to move these two toys to the left-hand side. We'd specify this to the robot by clicking on the pixels corresponding to these objects and where we want to move them to. The planner then comes up with different plans using our learned sampling distribution, and the predictive model will predict the corresponding outcomes. On the lower left, we show an example of such prediction, and then on the right, we show the execution of the lowest cost plan on the robot. So in this way, we can improve aspects of both prediction and planning without hindering generality. Our experiments show that with our approach, the robot can solve new tasks using previously unseen objects as tools. It can also manipulate objects that are out of reach. In the example on the left, we restrict the robot's action space so that it can only move within the green region. To retrieve the blue cylinder, it uses the hook as a tool to move it towards itself. And when traditional tools are not present, it can use, for example, a water bottle here on the right to move trash to the side. Finally, our planner also leverages the model to determine whether a tool is actually necessary for a task and chooses the appropriate plan. To summarize, we developed an approach that can solve tasks that are both diverse and complex from visual inputs. With our method, the robot can use previously unseen objects as tools and even improvise in the absence of traditional ones. And lastly, depending on the demands of the task, our planner can dynamically decide whether or not to use a tool. Thank you. Thank you. And the final talk of the second spotlight session is going to be end-to-end -end robotic reinforcement learning without reward engineering by Abhi Singh, uh, Larry Yang, Chelsea Finn, and Sergey Levin. And Sergey. All right. Uh, thank you. I'm presenting on behalf of Abhi Singh, who couldn't be here due to visa reasons. So DeepRL is great because DeepRL can learn complicated robotic tasks directly from image observations. The trouble is that in order for DeepRL to work, you need to somehow specify a reward function. And in reality, if you want a robot to learn with DeepRL in the real world, that means you have to somehow instrument your environment, put sensors on objects, or even actually build entire computer vision systems just so that you can evaluate whether the robot is succeeding so that you can actually run DeepRL. So maybe this is a, actually a little bit too tedious. Perhaps we can somehow use data to learn a reward function for DeepRL. I'm going to illustrate this with an example. Here, this robot is going to need to push a green cylinder onto the red circle. The first video that you'll see illustrates what the task is, just for your reference. And then what we're going to try to do is learn a reward function for this task using a classifier. So we'll use a few example images where the red, green uh, cylinder is on the red circle, a few failure images, and we'll train a classifier. So this is first just showing what the task looks like using a ground truth binary reward. The top right image shows what the robot sees, and the graph in the lower left, or uh, sorry, in the lower right, right, shows the reward function. Now, in the middle video, you can see the robot attempting to use the classifier to perform the task. You can see in the graph that the classifier actually thinks the robot is succeeding, but it's not doing the task properly. What it does instead is it performs a very peculiar motion that fools the classifier into thinking that it's succeeding by angling the fingers upwards towards the camera. So it's essentially generating an adversarial example. 
There's a method called variational inverse control with events, or VICE, shown on the right side, that repairs this problem by augmenting the classifier training set with all of the data from the robot. So all the robot's data is added to the classifier training set and labeled as a negative, and this largely repairs this problem. So in this work, we'll build on this approach to solve real-world robotic tasks from fixed law observations in an end-to-end -end fashion. Our goal is to do this without task-specific systems to compute rewards using data, uh, to do, do it with minimal robot hours and with minimal human intervention. So we'll augment VICE to make this possible. We'll start off with some examples of successes and failures provided by a human user. We'll train a classifier that outputs the probability of success and we'll use VICE so that all the additional data from the robot is added as negatives. Furthermore, we're going to accelerate learning by allowing the robot to make a small number of active queries. So if the robot is really not sure what's going on, it can also ask the user, is this a success or a failure, and add that to the training set. But it will do this very sparingly, just to accelerate training. So we'll have some goal examples. We use them to initialize our classifier. Then we're going to run RL using that classifier as the reward. We're going to do some active queries for the most uncertain samples to ask the user whether it's success or failures. Those get out to the training set, as well as negatives from the robot's experience. So here's our first experiment. In this task, the user provided some examples of successes. The goal is to move the cup onto the white coaster. And here you can see the training process at 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and one hour and 15 minutes. The entire training process involved 25 active queries to the user and 80 initial examples. So here are some of the queries. At the end, the final policy trained with this method, which we call vice rack, succeeds 100% of the time from different initial positions of the cup, directly from raw image observations for both the reward and for the policy. The naive classifier is generally unable to learn this task. The regular vice method makes some progress, but takes quite a bit longer than our complete approach. The active queries alone generally can't make progress, and our complete method learns successfully in an hour and 15 minutes. Now, we also wanted to see whether we could perform tasks that are really only possible from raw image observations. Here, the robot needs to drape this towel over a box. This requires it to watch the towel as it performs the draping motion to prevent any wrinkles from forming. So here's the final policy learned with our method. And to make sure that this actually requires using the image pixels, we gave the robot the final position of the wrist, did not give it the image, and looked at what it would do. So here you can see that it fails to perform the task if it's not using the image observation, which means that it actually has to watch the towel as it's draping. Here are the three tasks that we perform in this, uh, in this paper. You can see that vice rack achieves 100% success rate on all of them. The naive classifier never succeeds, and the baselines are somewhere in the middle. So uh, please come to the poster to learn more about our work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Then again, I'd like to invite all the speakers of the session to come up, please, for questions and answers. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a question there. I have a question to the last speaker, Sergey. Um, so I wonder how robust this approach is. Like an example with blue cup and white plate, what if I change the position of the plate to the cup at any moment? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. The robustness of this approach, as with any deep RL method, depends on the variability seen during training. So for the cup experiment, we varied the position of the cup, but not the coaster. If we varied both of them, then training would take a bit longer, but it would be robust to both. So you really have to vary whatever it is that you expect to vary at test time during training also. Other questions? So I have a question for the second talk. Uh, what if the, for the visual planning, so what if the, the, there is no topological continuity, no topological connection between the start and the goal? So if you have to cut the rope at some point, or, so there are some, some difficult uh, Hello, everyone. puzzles. And uh, so what's, uh, so how is the algorithm planning in this case? Um, so to, for the planning around, it does a star search in the latent space, but if it involves something like cutting the rope that it's never seen in the training data, it's not going to be able to know that that's physically feasible in this domain. And what if there is, a, there is this hard task of, uh, like, uh, like in this, is this puzzle, this level puzzle, where there is actually a, a continuous uh, transformation between the start and the goal, but it's, it's very, very untrivial to find it. Um, so hopefully the A star search will be able to find that lane space, um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm not sure if I'm understanding. Oh, all right. <laughs> well. Okay. Other questions? Um, then maybe I can ask a, a quick question to Chelsea. So um, 
uh, it was very impressive to, to see the results um, uh, of this learning in, in these embedding spaces. The actual uh, the actual distances that you used were this then Euclidean distances in these latent spaces, or did you also take into account some curvature of these spaces? So in this case, we were using Euclidean distances in the representation space that was learned, and we we're optimizing such that Euclidean distances in that latent space okay. did lead to uh, the actions observed in the data. Uh, in practice, you could also uh, try to consider optimizing for other metrics uh, in that space as well. Thank you. Okay. There's one question there. Hi. Um, I have a question for Sergey. Um, I'm wondering for the queries that you ask the humans, is there any sort of distribution for when it starts asking? Are they mostly focused at the beginning or is it like distributed because it sees new states and then gets very uncertain? Yeah, so there's a little bit of a design choice to be made in this and uh, I don't think we actually made that design choice in the optimal way, we just made it in whatever way worked. Uh, the way the, this works is that the robot gets a fixed uh, budget, so it can't just inundate the user with queries right away. It has to space out the queries by a fixed interval, and then within that interval it picks the state where it, it has the highest expected probability of success, meaning that's the state that is, it thinks is most likely to be erroneously labeled as negative. So the state it thinks is most likely to success within some interval is the one it asks for a label for. But there are many methods in active learning that employ more intelligent uh, query mechanisms, and those could probably help. Okay, other questions? Then maybe I can ask one more to Angelina also. Um, so uh, I was wondering also, when you showed the, the videos um, uh, with, with the rope basically, so the, the robot would, some, it looked sometimes in the video like the robot would almost undo some steps a little bit, it would go backwards just slightly. Is that something that you tended to observe uh, in general, or is that or something that you analyzed in, in any way? Um, yeah, sometimes the robot would try too hard to match the exact step in the plan, so if it overshot it in the previous step, um, it would try to like correct it and go back, because right. it is aiming for each step rather than the final goal, and it runs. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If not, then we're making up on time a little bit, and uh, let's thank the, the speakers again.